in kingdom law, als je zegt in Duits, Rijkswet financieel toezicht. Or a kingdom law on financial supervision, Mr. Chairman. And Mr. Chairman, that law came into force because of the country of St. Martin, and I say country very loosely, asking to become an autonomous country within the kingdom. And during that discussion, Mr. Chairman, what was very important, the Dutch government focus was on three things. Finances, administration, and judiciary. Ensure that those things are in order, but in other words, ensure that they can control those things. And hence, this <coughs> law, the Kingdom Law for Financial Supervision, or the Rijkswet Financial Toezicht, came into force. Some might say, Mr. Chairman, that we agreed to it. We signed, we said, yes, that is what we want. And Mr. Chairman, I can remember very well during that time, our then leader, member of parliament, William Marlin said, is it what we want? No, but it is a step towards what we want to accomplish. So Mr. Chairman, there are two cardinal articles, I know there are others that are important in that law, kingdom law, and I always want to maintain that there's nothing called a kingdom consensus law. Because nowhere in the Constitution, nowhere you'll find it written that it's a kingdom consensus law. It's a kingdom law, period. That goes through the process of what is laid down in the charter. Articles, I think, 15 to 21 or whatever. So Mr. Chairman, I am saying this to make it quite clear that St. Martin, this government, and any government before that that came in on the, after 2010, had to adhere to this kingdom law. And there are two articles, 15 and 25. One talks about what we have to follow in order to ensure that we have a balanced budget, and one what we can do in order to deviate from a balanced budget. And Mr. Chairman, we know for a fact that because of this, there are sudden decisions that have to be taken by government. But Mr. Chairman, before I, I want to make something clear. Um, yesterday during the meeting, when Minister was saying about the different inadequacies or the mess that we found in there, I'm sure that there are some who didn't like to hear that statement. Mr. Chairman, let me say this up front. One of the things that I always found was unfortunate is when the government that I support and supported back then sometime too, when you go in there, let the people know exactly what you found in there. What we normally do, we go in and we take them on our shoulders and try to better the situation. And then are blamed for things that we meet there, Mr. Chairman. So I would have liked to say, when we go in there, explain. But since we're going back there again after the election, Mr. Chairman, then it'll be ours to work on, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, this draft budget as I said before, and my colleague, Member of Parliament, William Marlin, said it perfectly. It is the people's budget. Is it what we want? Mr. Chairman, this budget, and I've said it from 2011, I've always called the budget since 2011 CFT budgets. I've always said, once the CFT said the budget is good, I get nervous, but again, that kingdom law is hanging over our heads. So this budget is the people's budget, Mr. Chairman, but with some strong ingredients from the CFT. Strong ingredients from the CFT.
So Mr. Chairman, I want to make that plain. St. Martin today is still dealing with effects of Hurricane Irma. You know how the grant went, World Bank. We are still dealing with the effects of COVID-19. And let me stop there for a while because, Mr. So Chairman, when COVID-19 hit us, like it did all over the world, our government, our Minister of Finance did not wait until the Dutch sent one red cent, like how we say in the Caribbean region, a one Dutch cent, as you would say. The Minister of Finance and the government, Mr. Chairman, decided my people need help presently, now, my colleague. <laughs> and he did not wait, but he used the present, the available reserve in order to deal with the people who needed assistance right away. Now, if you, you cannot say that that was not a responsible government, Mr. Chairman. They took measures into their hands immediately. Did not wait, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, a member of the minority parliament who's not here today said yesterday, they regret, they regret, Mr. Chairman, signing, agreeing to that motion, Mr. Chairman, to allow the government to do what it had to do for the people of St. Martin. Can you imagine? They have no answer, no solution, but they regret. Mr. Chairman, I want to dispel this statement because sometimes people seem to forget. St. Martin was the only island that fought for six months before subjecting the people to the conditions. And that's a fact. So those who might have selective amnesia, I'm reminding them, Mr. Chairman, that fact. So, Chairman, this budget, and I'm going to say right now, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to sign it. I'm going to prove it. I'm going to vote for it, Mr. Chairman. Because, Mr. Chairman, there are some things in there. When I look, the same teachers who some are fighting for, the vacation pay is in there 100%. The law enforcement vacation pay in there 100%, Mr. Chairman. The civil servants' vacation pay in there 100%, Mr. Chairman. The back pay of police officers in there, Mr. Chairman. So why should I vote against it? Because there are certain things I don't like, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, you know, let, let me do some mathematics here. If we take the teachers, law enforcement officers, civil servants, employees of government-owned companies, private employees who had to cut 20% of their salary, let's say it's about, let's say it's Let's say 3,000 person. Let's make it a small figure. Multiply by them by their families. You can go up to 15,000 person, Mr. Chairman, who were affected by this because that we had to do because of the Dutch conditions, Mr. Chairman. So this is why, Mr. Chairman, to restore the purchasing power of these persons, Mr. Chairman, definitely I will be supporting this budget. Mr. So Chairman, I was talking to someone, and I think it was Saturday, and they said to me, and I smiled when they said, they said if it was up to them, they'll have two budgets, this one and the other one. And I smiled. I said, that's not a bad idea. Maybe next time we can look at that. Mr. So Chairman, what I'm happy about is the issue of the, um, finally, government getting uh, to regulate the issues of the casinos and the lottery. So Chairman, if I could pull up speeches I did in 2011, 12, and 13, even prior to that in 2005, where I was always concerned by the fact that basically casinos were not paying their fair share, Mr. Chairman. And I'll go back to an old report from 1997, done by the way old they say, came out in 1997, I believe it was, where it mentioned that casinos generate 125 million guilders annually, but it is not reflected in government coffers. I'm talking before I got into politics, Mr. Chairman. So Mr. Chairman, the fact that now 
this government was able to get them back to the table because one of the former ministers, Roland Chewitt, tried it early, I think 2015, 16, he had a discussion with them. He had an agreement where they were gonna start paying their rents and maintain their current, their current payments, but government fell that year, so that fell through, the, that fell down also, that didn't continue. So Mr. Chairman, I'm happy to see right now, because the fact is, Mr. Chairman, I am asking for debt cancellation. You all know that I'm not gonna change from that. But at the same time, we have to get our own house in order. We have to get our house in order to make sure that revenues that can be collected are collected here in St. Martin, Mr. Chairman, from those who should be paying. Because I found out, and I said it more than once on this floor, when I checked to see the fees that the casinos are paying today are the same that they were paying in 1989, Mr. Chairman. 1989. 34 years ago. Mr. Chairman, I understood that we are looking at the um, at turnover tax. Well, I think the discussion should be increased fees or turnover tax, one of the two. The important thing is that we have to get more revenues into our coffers. And yes, when I mentioned the issue of the fees back in 2011, I can recall very well that a, a report appeared in one of the daily newspapers, I had two at the time, and it practically said that if the MP thinks that we can increase the fees, they will uh, start to lay off persons and they will also close down. And my response at the time, Mr. Chairman, was, go ahead, there are many local persons who would like to have a casino license, Mr. Chairman. And that was in August of 2011, I think it was. And we are here now, March the 23rd, 2023, and I see, I even planning, Mr. Chairman, I heard, to build a new casino. They are planning, Mr. Chairman, to build a new casino, so that should be looked into seriously. So, Chairman, the matter of the debt cancellation, and again, I repeat myself, where in 2021, I believe we were doing the budget of 2021, I think it was, and when I looked at what we owe the Dutch government, 1.2 billion guilders, the motion I submitted, 2021 June, that was approved by all my colleagues to request the government in the discussions with the Dutch government to ask for debt cancellation. And um, unless I didn't hear correctly, I think it was said that the Dutch government or the state secretary, I don't know which one of them, are uh, not in favor of discussing debt cancellation. And I think that it was said that the books are already closed for 2023. But let me, let me tell the people of St. Martin because, Mr. Chairman, I'm talking to the people of St. Martin, not my colleagues, because it's, it's their budget, as I said. The Dutch budget for 2023 is 395 billion billion with a B euro. They spent in defense in 2022 13.7 billion euro. In their budget 2023, they have an amount budgeted to assist their people with energy and high food costs of 17.95 billion euro. And you want to tell me, Mr. Chairman, that you can't write off 250 million euros, Mr. Chairman, which if I could do my math, I'm saying 0.0001% of their budget, Mr. Chairman. I want the people's amount to understand very clearly because while they were supporting, while they're still supporting their people, they told us to cut, my name is the chairman, 
Keep that in mind. Keep that in mind. Don't forget, because it is good to attack the government, but let us take the reality into mind, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sorry, you sign the motion. <laughs> What we would have done, people come in front of your door, tell you where's the money, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, a little bit on the Ministry of Economic Affairs. The minister has just taken up that position, and you can see he's hit the ground running, as we like to say. And one have to accept the fact that he just got into that position, so. I'm not gonna say, what are you doing about this? What are you gonna do about that? No, Mr. Chairman, there's a reality. You need time to get settled, to get adjusted, to look at see what was going on before, to create yourself, come with ideas, look at the apparatus, see exactly how they're functioning, see exactly, Mr. Chairman, how things went in the past and how you can work on things to improve them today, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I always look at how I can get money. Let me say it, show me the money because <laughs> Say whatever we want, we need money for the budget. We need money to pay all our expenditures and so on. And Mr. Chairman, I think I said it some time ago here, a couple of weeks ago. The, I was having, uh, lunch it was, yes, at one of the local restaurants and I saw that beautiful yacht in the lagoon and I looked at the name of the yacht and it was the Northern Star, the Northern Star. So my curiosity, you know, I. I Googled it, and I saw Northern Star, and then I saw, and if I had four eyes, it would have popped out of my head, Mr. Chairman, because when I saw the rental for the Northern Star per week, $430,000 a week, and that is packed up in our lagoon, Mr. Chairman, and I heard them complain about paying the fee to pass through the, the bridge, and they complain about that. You got to be sick. If you can afford $430 million a week, you should be able to buy the bridge and build it yourself, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, then the other day, Mr. Chairman, I saw another yacht, the Aegis. When I looked at the income, now she's a little lower level, you know. $23,000 a week to rent it. Something is not right, Mr. Chairman. Something is not right. I do not know what the St. Martin Laguna Authority is doing, but they have to do their job because the fact it means I'm always hearing a complaint that they're paying too much to come to our bridge. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, my colleague, Christopher Emanuel, mentioned something yesterday. And I passed on the same road. And that is why first control is important. But to get control, you need staff. You need to train them, you got to pay them, you need money. So, Chairman, I pass that road every day, sometimes three, four times a day. And I can remember about a little over a year ago, I passed on, I said, wait a minute, that place was a nightclub, I think it is, if my colleague can, can correct me. And then all at once now, I saw supermarket. I said, whoa, okay. And then I passed on, I saw bar and restaurant. Whoa, what's going on here? Now lately, Mr. Chairman, Gambling, Mr. Chairman, the machines. Yeah. And I'm saying, what is going on here? And that is why it's important to see exactly what kind of license they have, because it has to state when you permit a license what you are allowed to operate on. I know some markets could get breakers and so on. That was the next problem again, too, because, again, Mr. Chairman, things that I'm saying here now are not new. Because in 2005, I asked... I asked a then commissioner, I said, why are you giving, and I mentioned at this time it was the Chinese community, nothing against them, but why are you allowing them to open supermarkets, laundries, bakeries, Mr. Chairman? You are putting the locals out of business. Look at us today. Look at us today, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, the issue of the market, renovation, I just have um, one question for maybe two for my to do to the minister is with regards to the renovation. I know how many vendors are there now. Um, are we going to have the same amount of vendors there still after it has been renovated? And are those that are behind the courthouse going to be also taken into consideration? So 
those that are there now, and even behind the courthouse, are they also going to be taken into consideration when the new market comes to make sure that at least some, I don't hear that some have, don't have any space, so then that's it, you know what I mean? I, I'm, I'm concerned about that. I pass every single day, and they ask me every single day what is going on, so I have to pass it on. So Chairman, something that I, I, I don't see happening at all, and you know, I was born on the beautiful island of Aruba, and I know they have what you call in Dutch, an hunden vergunning. And Mr. Chairman, I believe it's important that that is looked into because I am seeing an increase in dogs all over the place, Mr. Chairman. And I think that if owners don't have their dogs on a leash or whatever, then we should ensure that we have a law in place that makes sure they do so. And that leash, whatever you want to call it, should have the name of the owner, the phone number of the owner on there in case when these dogs are caught, or you can know exactly who to call and who's responsible because, Mr. Chairman, it should not be allowed that the dogs roam all over the place, Mr. Chairman, and if someone is bitten, then you don't know who the owner is, and then the expense falls on the, on the individual or government, Mr. Chairman. So I think, look into that. For me, that's very important. Mr. Chairman, Something I said on this floor too, quite, quite, um, about, not quite, about a year or two ago, is the issue of um, animals that are being brought into St. Martin. Animals that are being brought into St. Martin. Mr. Chairman, through to the minister, do we have a law in place where it states when these animals are brought in, whether they have to be, um, what you call it now, if you get an injection to make sure they have no disease? Can't, can't remember the name right now. Is that? And rabies, yes, okay. Yes, and, uh, thank you. You're there to assist, thank you very much. You know, to ensure that when they are brought in, that especially in dogs, you have any rabies or whatever, but that government, what, what is the revenue? Do we get revenue out of it or do they just come in, we give them a piece of paper and that's it? Does government receive any finances from persons who bring animals into the country, whether it's dogs, cats, um, chicken, or whatever you call it, live fowls, you know, for cockfight and so on, which is to be outlawed. But anyhow, that's another thing, Mr. Chairman. But any animal, and even plants that are brought in, are there any laws in place to ensure that government generates funds from these things? It should not be that someone can bring animals, or plants, or whatever, into St. Martin. You sign a document, yes, I saw the animal, it's 10 feet tall, 4 feet wide, is there whatever. No, Mr. Chairman. Specifications, Mr. Chairman, and what is the fee? According to size, according to type of animal, we cannot allow a person just to bring an animal here, Mr. Chairman, and we get nothing from it. Because in other countries, that's not how it is. You have to pay. You have to pay, Mr. Chairman. So I, I would like the minister to look into that. Mr. Chairman, a very, very, very important thing here for me to do to the minister, Mr. Chairman, is are there any court cases right now um, against the harbor facilities, cruise facilities? Are there any court cases right now uh, that have been levied against the harbor cruise facilities? Because I can remember very well, years before, Mr. Chairman, and as I said, the minister was not there before, so these are things that, that he has inherited. But are there any court cases right now pending against the harbor group facilities because I can go back to 2015 when Zebek uh, was about to take the government to courts and they had an out of court settlement and I believe they ended up getting $10 million and um, which was paid, I believe by SSV at a 65% interest. That government had to, had to have had to pay back to them. So are there any pending court cases? Because Mr. Chairman, uh, sometime I think in May or June of last year, there was a court case I understood where Zebek again is coming after the harbor group facilities. Uh, they're coming after a former politician um, and also after another company that I can't recall the name right now. So I want to make sure because they're talking about $97 million. $97 million, Mr. Chairman. So we have to make sure because it's going to end up that if that goes through, you know who will have to foot the bill. And right now, we don't have any money, Mr. Chairman. So, 
The chairman just a bit on the justice and labor minister, I kind of put them together. I believe the minister of, of labor mentioned, and I should have taken note of that, but um, where there was either a department or whatever is going to be established to look into employers who um, are not filing for the employees and so on as to what can be done, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so due to, I want to say that there's already a law, and I, I have to make sure that I have that in my hand next time around, where fines can already be issued to employers who do not request for unemployment permit for the employees, Mr. Chairman. I'm happy to see that the Minister of Justice and Labor got together and allow for persons who are living on the island, working here for five years or more and so on, to be allowed to stay on the island while the documents are being processed. That is admirable, Mr. Chairman. But I'm yet to see where some of the budget you have where fines are being levied and collected from employers who still refuse, Mr. Chairman, yesterday. Yesterday, I got a call from a worker. They have five years working with this employer. And after, after some back and forth, finally, the employer, and then that I know the Minister of Justice made it plain that it is the employee that has to request permission to stay. But I understood in this case, the employer sent in a letter just about uh, a, a day or two ago. Now, three months has already lasted, Mr. Chairman. Again, there is money to be had right here, Mr. Chairman, right here in St. Martin. So that, for me, Mr. Chairman, is very important. And Mr. Chairman, this one is going to be a little tricky. I sat down, I just wrote it down, and I, it has to do, again, with the issue of persons who are requesting an employment permit, Mr. Chairman. Chairman, the law, the law apparently doesn't seem to be clear, but for me it is clear. Because the person requesting the employment permit is not the employee. The employee cannot request an employment permit for him or herself. If you have a business, or whatever, you can do it that way. But once you're working for someone, that person has to request for you. So it is the employer that has to request. But Mr. Chairman, what we know in reality is that the employee pays often, I cannot say all employers do it, but in most cases, the employer makes the employee pay that processing fee. Now, I have a little idea, Mr. Chairman, that I think a suggestion I'll just throw there. When this person pay, the employee, in the case when the employee pays, I believe they should have the receipt. And again, it, it, will it will come to those who are in a taxable bracket because you know there are some persons who don't pay tax because of the level of their income also. And if I'm incorrect, I can be corrected later on in this meeting or tomorrow it continues. Mr. Chairman, the individual who pays that processing fee, in other words, the employee, once they file their taxes, Mr. Chairman, of course, they have to state what company they're working for and everything. If in the event it proves that this individual has to get a refund from government, then that payment that they, have, that they were made, that payment that was made by the employee, government will refund that employee. And then the company or the individual who did not pay that deposit will be charged for that processing fee, Mr. Chairman. And if the person don't have a receipt and they can say the payment, Mr. Chairman, let me come with a statement, Mr. Chairman, we will go after the company because it is wrong that companies and individuals are making this person pay the processing fee, whether it's quite clear 
The law says the person requesting the employment permit has to pay. Mr. Chairman, when it comes to the issue of the residence permit, that is totally different because the individual has to request the residency him or herself. So that's a different matter altogether. Mr. Chairman, a, a complaint that I'm hearing, and I'm going to say this, and I hope there are some employers listening. There are some employers who have 4, 5, 10, 15, 20, or even more employees that are working in their company. But what is happening right now, Mr. Chairman, some of these employees are waiting until all the employees get their documents together so they could file one, go and make one submission for all. Mr. Chairman, I get my police, uh, my police record, it's, not a, it's a certificate of good conduct. Have my birth certificate, non-marriage certificate. All those documents, Mr. Chairman, except for the, the, the birth certificate, have an expiration date. And what I want to say to these employers, the persons whose documentations are in order, submit them. Because tomorrow, when time elapsed, they will be told, we are sorry, your document has expired. And Mr. Chairman, if it expires during the processing period, that's one thing. Then government is responsible. But if it expires before it is submitted, then they're responsible, Mr. Chairman. So I'm saying to the employers who have more than one, two persons working in the company, once that particular employer, employees have the documentation in order, submit the request. Don't wait on the audience because it's not fair to them, Mr. Chairman. So, Chairman, you know, there's an article that came out, you see, uh, July. 21st, entitled, The Prosecutor's Office Aims to Collect Some of the 1.8 Million Guilders in Outstanding Fees. Again, I repeat, Mr. Chairman, 2021, an article came out where it says clearly that the prosecutor office aims to collect some 1.8 million guilders in outstanding fines. Mr. Chairman, when I go back, an article in 2016 had already come out, prosecutor reminds public to pay outstanding fines from fine dodgers. The total relates to 3,999 traffic fines issued from 2017 to 2020 by law enforcement for various offenses. Mr. Chairman, while we need the funding, the prosecutor is not doing their job because why? From 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019, in 2021, we are still hearing from the prosecutor's office as 1.8 million guilders outstanding in fines. And now they're saying they do not know if it can be collected because they don't know the address, it will live on the front side, whatever, Mr. Chairman. That's revenue that we have on the street, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, the issue of education, I really wouldn't touch much on that because uh, questions were asked on that. And my, 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 um, my standpoint is that the present educational system, as it is, has to get a complete overhaul, and it's not going to happen tomorrow. Because you see, Mr. Chairman, the Eurocentric, Americanized system that we're in, I was, I'm busy reading a book that is entitled The Miseducation of the Negro. I'm busy reading one that talks about stolen legacy. I'm busy reading one that talks about Britain's black debt. See, Mr. Chairman, I don't want us to have ourselves trapped in a box 
by thinking that following the Eurocentric educational system will get us out of the box because it was put there to keep us in a box, Mr. Chairman, to keep us in a box. And I use the example that I saw from Dr. Richard Higgins. When he made a circle or heart or whatever, he said, look, he said, you see this box, he said? He said, all that I know or that I think I know is in this box. Mr. Chairman, but outside the box, there's more to know, Mr. Chairman. So if you allow them to keep us in the Eurocentric box, we will never, ever be able to become free in our minds. Emancipate yourself from mental slavery. Because there's some who think that the Dutch system is the best in the world and there to go. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, there's some things I would take over when it comes to meticulousness and so I would. But for the rest, we're cool here. We're cool here. Mr. Chairman, regards the issue of, of Rumi, <laughs> I made a suggestion. I'm going to repeat it now again, Mr. Chairman. There are persons who have built without a building permit. That's a fact. They had wooden structure. Hurricanes came. They decide concrete now. But they have no building permit, which means they don't have access to JB. So I'll go by my brother Christopher Emmanuel, pushing a card in his outlet and pass the card through his yard, and then I have count from him. Mr. Chairman, and that is what is happening. So my suggestion is, is two things. I don't see government knocking down hundreds of homes at all that were built without building permit. And if you think they're not hundreds, then think again, Mr. Chairman. They are in concrete. So instead of allowing this, my advice and suggestion is, Mr. Chairman, I said it before to the minister of Romeo when he was here. Do a control. G Let GB also be part of the control. And those structures that are already there, look to see exactly with safety concerns, see what is happening, see what can be done. And once they meet a particular requirement, Mr. Chairman, then you say, OK, the owner, whoever it is, you have to pay for building because because of the size and the location and so on. This is what you have to pay. Let them pay for it. And then let GB hook them up, Mr. Chairman, and then we have proper control as to light and water and who's getting what and who's giving what to who. That's a suggestion, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, uh, I think I'm going to make this the last for now because we have another round. Mr. Chairman, this has to do with our seniors, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I know, I know for a fact that we need money. And I know that all of us have to pay our taxes. Mr. Chairman, and you know, again, they all say the minister, the minister, that's true. But I know I dealt with the inspector of taxes myself on many occasions. And I can recall, and I said it already on the floor of this parliament, where in 1992, some 31 years ago, I received an assessment, Mr. Chairman, of 62,000 guilders. I'm going to realize they were right because I was not filing my taxes. <laughs> I thought the little green form, you get your sign, you send it, and that was it. But the income tax return form is what had to be filled in. So I got my documents, went to a tax consultant, and we bargained, got it down to 42,000. And then I was told, never forget, it was a, a Dutchman at the receiver at the time. He said, um, you have to pay this back in, what? Six months time and so on. I said, wait a minute. I said, I can only afford to pay 500 a month back then. And he said, yes, but I said, look, let me tell you something. I pay what I can afford. Why do I bring this up, Mr. Chairman? Because we have an old ordinance there of 1970, <coughs> which is used today to collect taxes in Vorderings Wet 1970. The collection ordinance that is more than 50 years old. Mr. Chairman, if I look at 
article, I think, A1, I don't know if you have it. Let me look at this article. Yes. The collection of taxes is mandated through the collection orders of 1970. I'm reading from a, 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 an opinion page written by someone that I know very well. It says, the collection of taxes is mandated through the collection ordinance of 1970. Article 6 of that collection ordinance reads as follows. The unvanger is bevoegd aan de belastingschuldige op zijn verzoek. Uitstel van betaling en gemakkelijke, toe, oh, gemakkelijke betalingsvoorwaarden te verlenen. Mr. Chairman. Now, Mr. Chairman, it is saying here, basically, we try to freely translate, that yes, the receivers or the tax office is allowed to make agreements with the taxpayer and to ensure that the payments are to such an extent where the person can afford it, make it easier for them. But what I'm hearing today, Mr. Chairman, you're told this is what you have to pay, Mr. Chairman. And I find that is incorrect. And coming back to our pensioners, our seniors, Mr. Chairman, and I'm looking at the law because the fact is we must find a way to ease the pressure on them. They've been screaming for years now. I mean, I can remember where they came to me several times, and when I saw the assessments, they were ridiculous. But if you can't prove, if you can't prove anything, you're in trouble. There's a law that I'm trying to get, and I got to contact my colleague in Aruba, where he was busy, and I'm talking about five, six years ago, making an amendment to the law where government cannot take more than the individual can afford. In other words, it should not be, yes, government has to take their part because, hey, government got to pay salaries, got to pay expenses. But at the same time, it has to be so that the individual is able to meet his financial obligations, Mr. Chairman. So, Mr. Chairman, that is something which I'm looking into because it is wonderful to stand on the floor of parliament and say I'm going to help the, the seniors and then when the time comes, fold my hand and that's it. Those persons have contributed to the building of St. Martin, to the setting of foundation, and therefore, in their senior years, Mr. Chairman, they cannot now be suffering because of this. <laughs> and before I close, Mr. Chairman, I had a discussion with a young business person. When I say young, I mean young because they're half my age. And they said to me, they saw this company this company that owed government taxes, okay, and they were assessed. And when whoever it was finished with accounting and so on, it ended up with government owned individual or owned the company. Why does it, Mr. Chairman? It is important that we have persons that can properly assess and ensure that the information that is given is accurate. That is key. So, Mr. Chairman, we have said one hour and 30 minutes or 90 minutes. I don't need all that time. But definitely, the matter of the seniors, some of them have told me, if they want, they could put me in jail because I can't pay. That's what I've been told. They said, I can't pay. You can put me in jail. I can't pay. You cannot have persons in their golden age, we'll call it, talking like this. There's too much pressure, Mr. Chairman. And there's something I said years ago in closing. I was at a town hall meeting. I had just got into politics, it was sometime in 2004 or something like that. So I was still a member of the Island Council. And I said to those persons who were sitting there, who had marched on the pond field, I said, look. And it had to do again with pension, Mr. Chairman. They were saying, you know, when they retire, it's so small and so on. I said, look, I said, let me say this to you. I'm talking almost 18 or so years ago. I said, look. I said, right now, you are working. I said, 
why not increase the premium then for those who are on pension now to make more? Because tomorrow, when you become of pensionable age, you can also benefit. They didn't want to hear that. Today we know that's big trouble right now in France because the President Macron forced through this uh, pension law to increase the age, I think, from 62 to 64, and they're making a bunch of noise on the street and they don't want to pay the swan. And, hey, Mr. Chairman, I'm not defending Macron. But I say this. There's a reality. Holland is, what, 67? President of age, 67. Then 65. Now we are 65 now. And if we don't get our act together, we're going to be in the same problem, Mr. Chairman. So all I'm saying, Mr. Chairman, that we have to prepare today for tomorrow. And as I said in the beginning, this budget, definitely, I will vote for it for the reasons I mentioned earlier. We have a second round, Mr. Chairman, and there. I'll decide exactly whether I should uh, continue or just say Hemi Ufta. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, MP George Pantaflet. The next person on the list is MP Solange Duncan. MP Duncan, you have the floor. Good morning, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Good morning to the SG. Good morning to my colleagues here in Parliament, to the ministers and their support staff, and a good morning to all those tuned in. Mr. Chairman, the government has been presented, or has presented its budget. Uh, it's supposed to be policy-based, meaning that the approaches presented are tied to figures. So each number is a policy, is a decision to act, is supposed to be a solution to a problem. And at the end of the day, in this chamber, we have a responsibility to not only question the ministers, but debate with them, go back and forth, to really evaluate what they have presented and uh, to see if indeed, according to at least our opinions, they are providing solutions to our problems. One of the most important ministries with the largest budgets in government, Mr. Chairman, the one that should exude hope, that should foster the creativity of our people, protect and safeguard our heritage and identity, is my favorite ministry, the Ministry of Education. When I look at the budget of the Ministry of Education in particular, though, I ask myself, are the policy approaches clear? What are the outcomes that the government are expecting from each sector, education, sports, culture, what are the specific approaches and are they measurable? Now, Mr. Chairman, the Minister of Finance started out yesterday saying that the previous budget was toxic and this is one of the healthiest budgets that we have seen so far that the adjustments that have been made has gotten this budget in shape. Well, I love that analogy um, because I mean, I think all of us now use this idea of toxicity in our everyday lives, right? We leave relationships because they're toxic. We leave jobs because they're toxic. But I wondered, what are the levels of toxicity in the <coughs> ministries right now in government? How toxic are they? What are the ministers doing in terms of very specific programs? Are they asking uh, the employees about how they feel about working in government. How do we really get our ministries back to healthy? Because according to what I've heard and what I've seen, we have some very toxic ministries right now in government. What does toxicity, Mr. Chairman, have to do with this budget and policy? People are behind policy. At least for now, art artificial intelligence isn't creating our policy. They're actual people, human beings sitting down, coming to work, making policy, writing, drafting, doing research. So people are at the center of everything that is done in government. And I'm not sure whether all ministers understand this concept. My colleague, Mr. Pantoflet, MP Pantoflet, mentioned that our education system needs a complete overhaul, but it can't happen just yet. You know, it'll take some time. 
The issue though, Mr. Chairman, is that everything takes time, development is a continuum, and we have to start now. We have to start now, and yeah. <laughs> I couldn't find a synonym for now, so I had to use immediately. I am quite concerned, Mr. Chairman, about the Ministry of Education in a number of different ways, not only about whether my former colleagues are being supported as they should, <laughs> but also the fact that we have curriculums that are way, way outdated. And who is responsible? You know, sometimes it amazes me that my 10-year-old daughter, who turned 10 uh, yesterday, um, may possibly be going through the same classes I went through or reading the same materials I read 20 years ago. No, 30 years ago, crap. 30 years ago. It, it blows my mind, and at the end of the day, who is actually or ultimately responsible for making sure that everything is pushing her forward, that this overhaul is happening? To me, it's the Minister of Education, and currently we have one minister over the last three years. Has the quality of education improved since this minister took office? That is a question that I want to know. Have the relationships with school boards improved? Have the quality of the lives of our teachers improved since this minister took office? That's the question I want. And whether the minister answers the question or not, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter to me. It's a question that I think is on the minds of everybody, not only parents, teachers, those employees of the ministry themselves. Mr. Chairman, a couple of months ago, I submitted a proposal internally for the establishment of a digital thesis library. Every year, hundreds of our students go off uh, abroad or uh, go to the University of St. Martin um, to pursue their tertiary studies. And one of the main components of uh, receiving a university degree is the completion of a thesis, a dissertation. Now, so much good research is done every year by these students that sits on the desks or in the cloud um, on policy solutions for St. Martin that we don't see. We don't see it in parliament or we don't see it in government. And it's unfortunate because this scientific research can be used to provide solutions to our problems. These are our students abroad or at home or in the region saying, listen, this is a, a serious problem and I want to solve it. I am going to interview stakeholders. I am going to speak to, to, to the persons in the, in the highest uh, positions to figure out if I can make recommendations for improvement. But we don't do anything with this research, Mr. Chairman. Last month, a journal article was released entitled A Cross-National Study on Adolescent Substance Abuse, Intentions, Peer Substance Use, and Parent-Adolescent Communication. The journal art article was written by three authors, one of which is Ms. I Ivy Defoe, a St. Martina at the University of Amsterdam. I was happy that Ivy tagged me on LinkedIn because this is exactly what I meant with the Digital Thesis Library. Important research is being done, whether here or off island, and this is research that the ministries can use, that parliament can use, scientific research. <coughs> now the research compares both alcohol and cannabis use in adolescents on St. Martin and the Netherlands. And the results are quite interesting, where there are more um, abuse of alcohol on St. Martin as opposed to the abuse of, of cannabis in the Netherlands. I would like to know through you, um, Mr. Chairman, to the Minister of Education, if the minister himself or policymakers at the ministry is aware of this research, if they have read it, I would like to know what the ministry is doing about substance abuse in our schools. I have a 14-year-old niece. I hear the stories. I hear the stories. I speak to school uh, coaches and coordinators and guidance counselors. We have a, a substance abuse problem on St. Martin. What is the Ministry of Education doing about it in particular? 
I'd also like to know, Mr. Chairman, if the ministry is in communication with schools, and if yes, what are the outcomes that they expect? Oftentimes, we get these answers like, we are speaking to stakeholders, but we're not hearing what the outcomes are. Okay, you've spoken to stakeholders now. What do you expect to happen? What are you trying to solve? There's always some missing information in the answers we receive from, from some ministers, um, Mr. Chairman, not all. We talk about substance abuse. We have to also talk about mental health, which is a serious issue, especially amongst young people. What is the minister's reaction to the call by young people, Teen Times in particular, for more attention, treatment, and intervention as it concerns mental health, Ill mental illness in schools? What is the ministry actively doing to prevent, to manage, to intervene? Or does the minister think that it is not the ministry's responsibility? Is it the, what is, what is usually said, the authority of the school boards? The school boards are the competent authority. In this case, when it comes to mental illness and substance abuse on St. Martin, <coughs> whose authority <coughs> is it? Mr. Chairman, I, re I read the answers of the Minister of Education following the, the Central Committee, and again, I don't usually get a clear picture of how the quality of education, the lives of our students and teachers and families are improving. The answers for questions, two questions, um, requesting an explanation for the cuts, cuts that included, let's say, the Department of Youth, for instance, the answer was we had to um, sorry, the answer was the, the department tried to make a budget neutral transfer, however, it did not meet the approval of the Ministry of Finance. Answers like these, uh, Mr. Chairman, do not give us a picture of the impact of the cuts. We know that that is why the cuts were made, but what is the impact? Let's say the BOP program. Will the cuts now to that program reduce the amount of students that will be allowed to work at government? I would love to understand more the impact of these cuts on, um, on the students. We know that the cuts are necessary to balance the budget, but what is the impact? The minister was asked about the cut to the Department of Culture's tangible heritage <coughs> post. The response gave a definition. Tangible cultural heritage refers to physical artifacts produced, maintained, and transmitted intergeneration intergenerationally in a society. In other words, built environment, buildings. It also includes natural environment, landscapes, ponds, artifacts. The minister answered, the country's dire financial situation requires that these cuts and cost-saving measures are warranted. However, on the presentation by the minister, one of the policy priorities for 2023 included to protect and promote national tangible and intangible cultural heritage and a strong shared cultural identity. So it's a big priority. Yeah, it was one of three priorities for the ministry. However, again, when the cuts are elucidated, you don't understand the impact, and you don't get a sense that um, that particular post or the department was, 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 was fought for, so to say. Another thing that grinds my gears, Mr. Chairman, is that coming from the minister, ministry, I don't hear creative ways in which the departments can be supported to do their work. I always acknowledge the fact that there is a capacity issue, always. But I don't ever hear any creative way in which capacity is being sought in this ministry in particular. I hear that research is being done, but there is no plan, no program to assist those that are physically in the ministry to achieve the goals that they have set for themselves, the actual work.
Through you, Mr. Chairman, to the minister, I would like to ask the minister to articulate exactly how the ministry aims to promote and protect natural, tangible, and intangible cultural heritage and a strong shared cultural identity in 2023 as per the priority that the minister mentioned. Mr. Chair, special needs has been a topic over the last um, few years. We've heard a lot about the needs of the special <laughs> needs community on St. Martin. There's also an increase in special needs students in schools. More private schools are popping up. Uh, more programs dedicated to special needs students are popping up. So there is not only a need, but a demand that government act. <coughs> Is government making a priority, special needs a priority? Is the Ministry of Education making um, special needs a priority? The ministry has been working on a special needs policy for quite some time. It's supposed to be ready this year. Um, it is supposed to mention a number of different procedures, standards, and so forth, but we are not hearing um, a specific <coughs> training program for staff. We are not hearing communication between the Ministry of Education and the Ministry of Health to support therapists that also support uh, teachers in special needs schools. We are not hearing that the current facilities, the current schools that cater to the needs of special needs children are being equipped with the resources that they need. I haven't heard that from the minister yet, and so I would like some clarity, Mr. Chair on those very specific things. In addition to the policy, what exactly is happening as it, as it pertains to special needs? Special needs school, Mr. Chairman, requires a safe, accessible, and comfortable facilities, wheelchair ramps, wide doorways, sensory rooms, and quiet spaces for students who need a break from stimulation. We ourselves in here just need a break from stimulation. We just go into the press room to relax. We have one elementary special needs school right now, the Prince William Alexander School. Does the Prince William Alexander School have a sensory room or a quiet room for the students? We know that the school is being built, that in 2020, the ministry commissioned a design criteria report that would entail the requirements to accommodate students in those classrooms. Has that report been used to accommodate the students right now in special needs classrooms? We're always talking about the future state, but we have students now who need that sort of support. What is really happening as it concerns our special needs schools right now? Approximately 2.4 million guilders have been spent on POAS on the project so far. <coughs> the reconstruction was stalled and now it's supposed to be continuing. I just mentioned the design criteria report, Mr. Chair, and I would like to know if Parliament can have a copy of it. I would also, as a, again, reiterate that I would like to know um, what elements of what is necessary for students with special needs to be successful, what elements are present right now at the Alma Fleming Center and at the vocational school. We speak often about the students, um, Mr. Chair, but another critical need is staff who are trained, who feel comfortable, who know what they're doing, who have all the tools necessary to assist these students. The therapists as well on St. Martin, we only have a few, speech therapists, occupational therapists, are they supported as well? Because they have a lot of work to do. Students leave the school and then they go to therapy. Are they being supported now and how? How are they being supported exactly? And so Mr. Chair, exactly <coughs> how are teachers and therapists being supported, those who are in contact with special needs students? Exactly how are they being supported? 
tools, resources, trainings. A colleague MP asked how the ministry is addressing the issue of teacher burnout and ensuring that educators have access to the necessary resources to support um, the maintenance of their own mental and emotional well-being. This is what the minister responded. The Division of Public Education within the ministry will continue to focus on promoting teacher well-being. And each school has been tasked with organizing this school year events, motivating teachers, improving morale among staff, and building a team atmosphere. The only answer to the how of that question was events for motivating teachers. Is this all that the ministry is doing for teachers? Is there any, is there any more specific programming? Um, anything else that the ministry is doing for teachers? Because events to me are a very uh, short term sort of sporadic interference. I am not sure whether teachers or the well-being of our teachers will be uh, promoted and improved over, over time. And if, besides the events, other programs are going to be introduced in this year, what budget uh, will be provided for these programs? So how much will these events cost? How will morale be improved? And what is the cost for improving morale? So Mr. Chair, I told you that uh, yesterday my daughter turned 10. I, uh, when, I, when I was pregnant, I was a, a mere policy advisor at the immigration department, actually with the Khifir. <laughs> we were at uh, the Ministry of Justice. And um, like most mothers, expecting mothers, I returned to work three months after I, I had my daughter. I didn't have any extra time. I didn't ask for any extra vacation. About two months after, I had to return to work. Uh, my mother wasn't retired as yet, so I couldn't depend on her to stay at home with my daughter. So what I needed was a safe, dependable, and affordable space to carry my daughter to, what we call daycare. I believe, and I can't remember, but I paid almost about $300 monthly for daycare in 2013. Mr. Chairman, a single mother in 2023 is probably play, paying $500 a month for daycare, for the same daycare in this economy. It is my belief, and I never really talked about it much before, but I said, let me bring it up now, that early childhood education needs to be subsidized by government. That is something that I strongly believe. And maybe because the sector is so small, or maybe because if you're not a mother, you wouldn't understand, there is a huge dire need for the regulation of the daycare sectors, uh, the sector and, and early education, um, early childhood education in particular. If government were to subsidize early childhood education, it would ensure that families had access, more families, to quality care for their children. That the learning gap between parents of, let's say, lower incomes would be closed. Because I can tell you, Mr. Chairman, there are families right now that are sending their children to daycare and they're not paying because they simply cannot afford it or children are staying home and not being stimulated as they should. In 2022, a proposal entitled Development of a Sustainable and Equitable Funding Model for Daycare and After School Programs was presented um, after a request from government to UNICEF Netherlands. This uh, was asked um, of UNICEF 
uh, the development of a sustainable and equitable model for early childhood de uh, development for safety nets in St. Martin that would promote inclusion and integ in equity and uh, also that a data management system be developed for early childhood development in centers and afternoon school pro programs. So to quote from the report, Mr. Chair, investing in early childhood is a development, economic, and social imperative worldwide. Early childhood development programs ensure a healthy start to life, leading to widespread implications for a nation's economic and social development. Early childhood is the most critical stage for investment. Decades of neuroscience research unequivocally demonstrates the period from conception through early childhood as a window of opportunity that cannot be missed, since a majority of the vital connections that shape the foundation of brain development are formed during this phase. Failure to invest in ECD, early childhood development, has a deep and persistent negative effect on society, leading to increased education expenditures due to high repetition and dropout rates attainment. Large health-related spending as a result of poor health outcomes, increased social spending and welfare expenses due to higher crime rates, delinquency, unproductivity, and unemployment. I don't think anyone can argue against the need for investment in early childhood uh, education and development. In our sector, uh, I'd like to acknowledge um, the work that is being done. Our daycares, there is a daycare association sector, are doing the best they can. Um, there's a food program for daycares, daycares which, are, which is very important. Um, there's a coordination of trainings and workshops. And I believe, Mr. Chairman, it is high time that government be of greater to support and take some more responsibility as it concerns the early development of our children. And so, Mr. Chair, through you, I would like to know what is the philosophy of the Minister of Education and the Ministry on the financing of early childhood education. The report presented a few models one model said roughly three million guilders could be spent on improving the quality of daycare. Just three million guilders. This report was done a year ago, Mr. Chair, and I haven't heard the minister mention anything in particular in terms of having the research now and making a policy decision. This is a research. This is how we believe we should act. This is a model that we're looking at. Let me start to begin to speak to the Minister of Finance about seeing where I could maybe get half of that money in order to invest in the development of our people early, early on, early on in their development. Specifically, Mr. Chairman, I would like to know to the Minister since the report was completed, what decisions were made as a response to the proposals in the report? Very specific. The report also, and it's a, it's a big report, and um, it's a very important one too. I am happy that the research was done, but now we need that action. We need the action. We don't need any more research. We need action. The report also proposed the creation of private-public partnerships to share the costs Government, I know, will not be able to bear the full cost of supporting daycares. Supporting schools are already a huge, huge part of the budget. So how do we support daycares now? We speak to companies. We incentivize the partnerships that will allow companies to have some sort of corporate social responsibility. And we do it together, together. It's not about you, it's not about me alone. Together, we can really see a difference in our society. It takes all of us. Mr. Chairman, so specifically uh, through you to the minister, has the ministry ever had discussions 
with any of St. Martin's largest corporations or companies to discuss partnerships? Has there ever been talks about any public-private partnerships? And what were, what, what were those discussions? And if there were discussions, what were outcomes? What were the outcomes from those discussions? To quote the conclusion of the report, the main priority for St. Martin should be to gradually expand the coverage of daycare and after school programs with a special emphasis on the most vulnerable children. A special focus on disadvantaged children will allow the country to achieve the fastest possible progress. Another challenge will be to strengthen and improve coherence and harmonization within the sectors. <coughs> One aspect that is crucial for the strength of these sectors is financing. There have been attempts at establishing funding models for the daycare programs in the past, but there has not been a systematic effort that has resulted in the establishment of a stable model. Is it time now that we establish a stable model for daycares? From early childhood education to tertiary education, Mr. Chairman, uh, there is an agreement between the Ministry of Education and the uh, American University of the Caribbean, AUC, for local students to study medicine there. I know at least about two students um, that are soon finishing up. I'm extremely proud. I would like to know, however, if these local doctors are guaranteed work in their own country because we've heard the horror stories of doctors coming back home and not being able to work. Why? Because they studied outside of the Netherlands. I know that the Minister of Health is looking at what is called the big registration. I would like to have an update on that, but I would also like to know between the Ministries of Health and the Ministries of Education, is there communication and collaboration as it regards these eight students who are going to become doctors soon? Will they have a place on St. Martin to practice, especially when we are in dire need of doctors? We have to learn how to close loops, Mr. Chairman, in this country. So students are getting scholarships, which are great, but then will they be guaranteed work? Will they have a space or will they be run off like former doctors who came here to set up and couldn't set up? The University of St. Martin, Mr. Chair, just introduced a Bachelor of Arts in Social Work via their UVI at USM partnership. A request was made to include social work on the study financing priority list. My question to the Minister of Education is, is it the intention to include social work on the study financing priority list? And if not, why not? When we were at IPCO, Mr. Chair, there was a session on student success in the Netherlands. It might probably forever be a topic because at the end of the day, you know, our students move to the Netherlands and, um, you know, besides culture shock, there is so much that they need to um, get used to in transitioning from, you know, their islands to, to Holland. And this idea that some students are mostly Caribbean students um, struggle with success in the Netherlands is a continuous discussion um, at all levels, at kingdom level, local levels, and so forth. What I realize is that in these studies, in the research, there is always limited information from our government, and in particular, the division of study financing. Always limited information. 
Yet on the budget, there is an increase for 50,000 guilders for the upgrading of the study financing database. I would like to understand, Mr. Chairman, what exactly is this database? What is the data that the database compiles and manages? Who manages the database? What is this upgrade for? Um, and what is the information that the department has specifically on our students? Because I think we've been given study financing since the, 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 the Antillian days. So why is it so difficult to understand how many students right now are studying the Netherlands? What is their success? What is the communication between the division and students abroad? Yes, there are free movers. We understand that. Um, but it's interesting to me when there is research done on all the Caribbean islands, data on St. Martin is always limited. So I would like to understand what is happening at the study financing uh, department, specifically as it concerns um, data management. Mr. Chairman, I, a year ago in this parliament, we passed unanimously, I'm not sure if MP Emanuel supported it, I would have hoped so, we unanimously passed a motion on the state of sports. What is happening in sports? And it has been a year and no report was sent to parliament. We have had no meeting on sports. And the issue is, Mr. Chairman, that the minister, in my opinion, just simply refuses to come. He just. What is sad also is that I have also requested a meeting of technical experts of the ministry. So minister, I understand that you're busy. At the end of the day, the work is being done by the staff, by the department heads. A lot of work is being done. So let the staff come and let us know what is happening. So we are informed that the people of St. Martin are informed and that we can see how we can be of support to the departments directly. But this has not happened. The Ministry of TIAT, we had a committee meeting where the department heads of TIAT were in here. Everyone enjoyed that meeting because the technocrats, the technical experts were here to tell us, listen, these are how these policies are carried out. These are why these decisions were made directly. Why is it always an issue with the Ministry of Education? Why? I would like to ask the Minister of Education through you, Mr. Chairman, where is the report on the state of sports? The minister announced, uh, Mr. Chairman, that he collected 110,000 guilders from his one cent on gasoline initiative. I agree that that was a really um, good endeavor. Um, however, I don't remember the minister mentioning where that money has been allocated to. Has it been earmarked? Where is it going? Is it going to sports? I'm not sure, and I would like to, to ask the minister for a direct answer on that. A minister, um, sorry, Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> Jerry, Jerry Seinfeld asked President Obama once, right, what sport is politics most like? And he said, it's probably like football, American football, right? A lot of players, a lot of hitting. Every once in a while, though, you see an opening. You hit the line, you get one yard, you try a play, you get sacked. It's third and 15, you punt. Every once in a while, there's a hole you see an open field, touchdown. I'm sorry for those who don't watch American football because... <laughs> I, like, I, like, I like President Obama's quotes. It has been three years since this minister has been on the field, Mr. Chairman, three years. 
He's been on the field. He's taken some hits. But is the ball moving down the field? That's, that is my, my question. Has this minister moved education further, heritage protection further, sports further? Has he? One yard, one play, has he? Did he provide the people, the people behind the policies, the people behind the programs, did he provide those people with the tools and the resources that they need to be successful? I see other ministries getting very creative. I keep saying that, Mr. Chairman, very creative. But why isn't there? Yeah, the Minister of Finance is smiling. <laughs> very creative. But why can't the Ministry of Education be creative? Why aren't the people working there supported? Why are the levels of toxicity so high? Because there is high turnover at the ministry. We say capacity, capacity, capacity. Yes, there's a difference between not having enough staff and the staff feeling demotivated, um, feeling uninspired. There's a difference, Mr. Chairman. And I had to use this opportunity to express how I feel about what is happening in education right now, Mr. Chairman. And I really hope that I can get some direct, honest answers from the minister. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, MP Solange Duncan. The next person on the speaker's list is MP Angelique Rumu. Put on your mic. MP Rumu, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A pleasant good morning to you. Pleasant good morning to the ministers here present this morning and their support staff, to my colleague MPs, and of course, the viewing and listening public. I had asked most of my questions during the Central Committee meeting, but I have some follow-up questions, and I will start with the Ministry of Education. For the Division Public Education, I start. And through you, Mr. Chairman, to the minister, in the minister's response to a question that I posed during the Central Committee meeting regarding training for public school teachers as it relates to incorporating technology in education, the minister mentioned the introduction of a hybrid learning system. Hybrid learning being where students spend at least half of their time learning online and the rest of their time learning in the physical classroom. So my question to the minister through you, Mr. Chairman, is can the minister explain a bit more about how the ministry envisions this for public schools? What does it mean for a practical school day in the public school system? And the most important question is why switch from blended learning to hybrid learning? I would also like the minister through you, Mr. Chair, to outline what school materials were ordered per public school for the school year 2022-2023, and what materials will be ordered per public school for the school year 2023-2024. All of these questions relate to previously asked questions. Additionally, I would like to know per public school, how much of their 2022 budget post specifically for school materials were actually used. I move on to the St. Martin Vocational Training School. Through you, Mr. Chairman, to the minister, can the minister give an indication preferably as far back as 2010, but if not possible, as of 2017, which is five years ago, on how much money was spent 
by the government on giving St. Martin Vocational Training School an official status. Money spent on the introduction of the AGO, Arbeids Gericht Onderwijs, and in English, the labor market-oriented education curriculum, and any other improvements geared towards formalizing the education given at the school. I would like to know through you, Mr. Chairman, to the minister, how many students are currently attending the St. Martin Vocational Training School. And of these students, how many are AGEO students? And does the St. Martin Vocational Training School have a specification on those students? Also, how many special needs students does St. Martin Vocational Training School currently have? And do the students from the Prince William Alexander School automatically go to the St. Martin Vocational Training School and what provisions are made for them once they are there? As I revisited the various budgets, I have some questions. One for Staff Bureau. What is the Staff Bureau's intention with budget post 6,021-43,476 of 102,448 guilders, which is for legal and other expert advice? And how much of this budget was actually used in the 2022 budget? And can the minister elucidate what activities these monies were spent on? As for the Department of Education, some questions as it regards the school busing policy. What is the update on the school busing policy? The ministry has been busy for quite some time now revising this policy to a more cost-effective one. What is the update on this? And how much of this budget was actually used in 2022? What is the department's intention with budget post 61,010, 43,476, which consists of 200,000 guilders? for legal and other expert advice for 2023? And additionally, how much of this budget was actually used in 2022? And can the minister elucidate what activities these monies were spent on? Final question for the Department of Education. What are the planned activities for 2023 for the budget post 61,010, 43,489, and for education reform. And as I move on for the Department of Youth, can the minister through you, Mr. Chairman, explain for the listening public exactly what the BUP program is and what it means for our students? How many students were catered for last year in the program? And how many students is the program expected to cater for this year? And does the department expect to see an increase in interested youngsters for the program this year? How many students did this program cater for on average pre-COVID and pre-IRMA? for the Division of Educational Innovations. What activities are planned for 2023 on the, the Education on the Move budget? And what activities were carried out last year under this same budget post? How much of this budget was actually used in 2022? What educational innovations is the division busy with for 2023 and how is this reflected in the 2023 budget of this division? My final questions for the ministry. This pertains to the Department of Sports. Through you, Mr. Chairman, can the minister explain and outline what was done in the school year 2021-2022 with the school sports program? 
what are the activities planned for the upcoming school year for the 2023-2024 year with the school sports program? And finally, with the, redu with the reduction in the budget for this program, what does this mean for the program? And please outline what adjustments, cuts or cuts, to the program will happen as a result of this. I move on now to the Ministry of VSR. Three questions. Through you to the Minister of VSR, what activities and programs are planned in 2023 that directly impact our seniors? And can the minister give information on what assistance is given to our seniors who are shut in? And what are the plans in 2023 and beyond to cater to this vulnerable group? Final question to the minister. Does the ministry have data on the actual number of seniors who are shut in? And the final ministry today, the Ministry of Romi, through you, Mr. Chair, to the minister present today, regarding the car wreck removal project, which I commend the minister on, because this is indeed an eyesore for the island. But it also poses health risks for our community as these wrecks become breeding sites for mosquitoes, rodents, etc. I have received some inquiries from residents about car wrecks inside the neighborhoods, so those you don't see from the main roads. So my question is, does the ministry have a portal or a way that residents can inform the ministry of car wrecks in their neighborhood? And I think a question that many citizens ask, and we've been asking it and we get different answers. So for us, what may seem as a car wreck, they say can be considered as an abandoned car. So for clarity for myself and for the community, because we keep getting this question, what is considered as a car wreck that can be removed under this project? And I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, MP Angelique Romo. The next person I see is MP Akeem Arendel. MP Akeem, you have the floor. Good morning, Chairman. Good morning, Ministers. Good morning, everyone. I will not be long today because most of my questions have already been asked. All I would like to say is one general statement for all the Ministers. How do I feel about the budget? I would like a reaction for you, like how do I feel, each one of you individually. How would I statement, like, because we're hearing, oh, the budget is unrealistic, all of this. I just want to hear your statement on what, how I feel about the budget. And also, um, pertaining to, sorry, the Minister of Justice, only one question I had for her was, how are we with the compliant, compliant international human rights standards regarding the state of the GF facilities? That would be it. Thank you, MP Akeem Arendel. I would like to take a short break uh, for 10 minutes, meeting adjourned for 10 minutes.
Welcome back. And the next speaker on the list is MP Rolando Bryson. MP Bryson, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And a good afternoon or good morning. Oh, yeah, afternoon already. Good afternoon, good afternoon to you. Good afternoon to the Secretary General, my colleague, members of parliament, the honorable ministers with us today, and those following this meeting by various forms of media. Mr. Chairman, yesterday, like I said in my notification, I had to thank the eight who were here. And that eight was really um, geared towards the coalition of eight. But again, this morning, it shows that at least some, at least some do understand that we can have our political differences and political strife. But I see the, yes. Although they can have those differences and such, we recognize the need to be able to have our budget handled. Come, Mr. Chairman, if, it, if, if it's about just having eight people in here and then saying that who can't talk, every single time a member of the opposition was to come to speak, if we were to have that type of behavior, then they would not speak because we would go in the press room and say that we feel cold. Mr. Chairman, I guess the rest of us have somehow shivered our way and with a shivering hand were at least able to just sign into the meeting because some say they felt too cold. So Mr. Chairman, to you, I would like to ask, can you please install a thermometer, something nice, just so we have that big clock there. Put a thermometer so we can monitor the temperature to make sure that the room is comfortable enough and then maybe they can find a different excuse for why they can't be here in the hall when they are right across the room. Mr. Chairman, I, I took note of a lot of the statements and questions and such. And Mr. Chairman, you know, I am fair enough to say that many of the questions that I would hear asked are fair, you know, um, especially the ones that are policy-based. Some of them are very factual and hard to refute, you know, when somebody pull out a license plate and saying this and that. It is now up to the challenge of the minister to see, you know, if that is indeed the case or not. But you have some who come here and they try to find, you know, the typical thing. I gotta find a way not to support this budget because I was part of the government before, but I gotta find a way not to support it anymore, you know? And I had the, uh, the unfortunate displeasure of having to sit here and listen for like 40 minutes to a soliloquy on why this budget ain't no good. And in essence, what it came down to, to this person, is that because we didn't, the government did not stick to its governing program and didn't do nothing with decolonization. Mr. Chairman, that type of sentiment, and more often, the people of St. Martin are going to be able to see the problem I was dealing with in this party, that you yourself, Mr. Chairman, and others within the UP party will understand, that's the problem right there. Constantly pointing the finger at everyone else and forgetting that three are pointing to yourself. What do I mean by that, Mr. Chairman? My former UP member spoke of emotions and different motions for decolonization and what needs to happen and if we had do this, we would not have been in this situation now. Mr. Chairman, I would like to point to motion number three of June 29th, 2021. It's quite a while ago, indeed. And in this motion, it was, and key to import, to, to show here, it was an amended motion. Because when my colleague at the time brought me this motion, I said, look, in that first resolution, parliament has to also do its part. Because it's the parliament that has to, re have to really come to an understanding of even what they see as decolonization. Because if you look in the DP faction, both of them got completely different definitions of what decolonization really is. And then after two years of saying decolonization is that, the leader of the UD, DP, or whatever they call themselves now, oh yeah, um, you know, I don't think that's decolonization. And just like that, she completely changed her mind. So what is decolonization in the first place? How do we deal with that? What do we want from it? So to deal with that situation, in the motion, the first resolution, what does it say? Resolve to request the government to review 
and give feedback on a comprehensive multi-annual plan to be presented to the government by the parliament for the execution of the UN motion, chapter this, and all of those different things, and all those letters have been flying back and forth. Parliament, on the proposal of the MP, Grisha Heiliger Martin, that is written right here, that brought this motion, was supposed to create it. Mr. Chairman, to this day, we waiting on it. Has the parliament ever handled a document called Comprehensive Multi-Annual Plan on the Decolonization of St. Martin? Have any one of us had the opportunity to give feedback into this plan, put it together, and then give it to the government? And then you could say, government, you didn't do what you had to do. This is basically, to use it loosely, the last instruction that the prime minister received from parliament regarding decolonization. And she's sitting right across there saying, but you ain't do your job. And that is the problem that we have been dealing with. Too many people trying to find a way to blame the government for their own inadequacies, for their own lack of work. Mr. Chairman, today I actually have to say, I, I, I owe MP Emmanuel an apology. I owe him an apology. Because Mr. Chairman, I once insinuated that the MP was the laziest member of parliament. And boy, am I wrong. Because this right here is the epitome of laziness. <laughs> MP Emmanuel will go and, and go to dig up traffic books from his daughter and go and get license plates. At least we're seeing something. But this lazy MP sits here in this parliament Blames the government and said the main reason this budget ain't no good is decolonization, but you literally did not do your job. Mr. Chairman, I believe that we have a lot to do in terms of our constitutional activities and adjusting the Kingdom Charter. I believe we have to do those things, yes. I believe that looking at things like reparations, debt cancellation, and all of these changes would most certainly help our government we be able to present better and better budgets. But are we, any of us, are we just sitting down here waiting on the government to do everything? No. You know how we handle in reparations? We bring the 1XXM Association on the proposal of MP Duncan. We then create our own committee. We create our own vision to provide to the government for these type of things. You don't just feel that you copy paste a letter from one of your staff and send it to the government, and then the job is done. That's not how your job as a member of parliament, if you truly do feel that this is what it has to be, then do the work. That is my issue. So basically, you can take that whole speech about why the budget ain't no good and point it right back to this, and I would ask the government Please, maybe you can get us an update from the Member of Parliament when the Parliament will do its part with regards to decolonization. Mr. Chairman, references were made to the governing program. The governing program was indeed created pre-COVID and was amended in March of 2021 post-COVID. And there's something that this Parliament and this government that goes very underrated. In many times in the past when St. Martin has faced disaster, it is at that point that the strength of the parliament as well as the strength of the government is best measured. And at the time, did I and other members of parliament have concerns with certain things that we were doing during COVID? Of course. Did we have ample opportunities to give our feedback to the government? to interpolate them, to support them with motions when necessary, or maybe even adjust the course of action when necessary by motion. For example, by reopening the country and presenting a motion for it. Yes, members of parliament had that opportunity, Mr. Chairman. But it cannot be discounted that the governing program of the country was never originally built to deal with the new world, so to speak, that we have post-COVID. And I will give credit 
to the Parliament of St. Martin, and I wouldn't even say just the coalition. There were motions where all of us supported, or maybe where one stood his ground and said, no, I'm not supporting. But like my colleague MP George said today, it wasn't with an easy heart that we passed those laws for the 12.5%. We resisted and we looked for every other option, but what did the parliament agree at the time? Prime Minister, you do what you gotta do, and we gonna do what we need to do. That is the functioning of our parliament. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, sorry, thank you. Yes, we are good. Um, so the fact that we have had to deal and endure with COVID-19, the SSRP, the fact that we have had to deal with SSRP, um, Mr. Chairman, can MP you clarify? Bryson, we'll have to wait till we get a quorum. Okay, let's hold one second, thank you. Can we sign in? Can we have a quorum now, we, quorum. we may proceed. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, the Mr. Chairman, can I maybe ask that you adjourn for one minute and figure this out because it's quite distracting what's happening right now because it's interrupting my speaking time. So I prefer I would ask. MP Bryson, you may proceed. Thank you. We have the quorum now. All right. And Mr. Chairman, yesterday um, somebody was asking. If it's too cold, and I would say actually right now in here is a bit hot. If maybe the air could can be turned back on while I'm speaking. Is my speech? Uh, my colleague is saying this is my speech. But in that case, let's see if we can get the temperature back up, get back up in here now. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, the government has had to endure via all this time, not business as usual. We had to deal with COVID-19, a very serious pandemic which both up ministers, successive up ministers, Minister Panafleck and Minister Otley, in hindsight, everyone would agree, did an excellent job. We came up with innovations that many countries used St. Martin as a model, which was the EHAS. We were one of the first to create such a system. We had the SSRP that was rolled out quicker than most countries was able to do. How much was it, Mr. Chairman, let me ask the minister if he can remind the public, how much was, was put into SSRP and other enterprise support during the COVID-19 period, et cetera. I would like to hear from the minister, remind what we had to do to keep this country afloat. Mr. Chairman, so when you take the governing program, you have to also take it in the context of what St. Martin had to endure. And I grade on that curve, the government that I support. And I grade this budget as maybe the first budget in the four years that this government would have, this would be the first budget in which we actually can start to really act post-COVID. 2020, 2021, and 2022 budgets were still recovery budgets. This is our first balanced budget. This is our first budget where we see significant investments in the country. And that is what I finally see in the budget here. And that's why I support how this budget has been presented, the details that have been provided, and the effort that has been done by the civil service, by the ministers, by everyone involved to bring a budget to St. Martin that is balanced and that provides significant investments. Mr. Chairman, if you look at the amount of investments that have gone into into the country at this point, based on this budget. Yes, some will highlight that you had 21 million, I believe was stated in operational cuts. But you can't look at just the operational cuts without looking at the millions that is now projected in capital investments. Something that is unprecedented, yet realistic. Tammy says so, Tammy the minister says so, even CFT says so. CFT has told us multiple times in the meetings here and in informal meetings in the conference room that they have seen an amazing improvement from the government in their ability to present capital investments. And in those discussions, they believe that these, cap these capital investments will materialize. So how do we only look at the 
operational side of the government of the budget and say, yeah, but this budget doesn't do nothing, but then completely ignore 85 million guilders in 2023 and 40 something million in 2024, going into bettering schools, roads, infrastructure, tourism, all of these necessary investments. So th that is not a fair and complete picture of the budget. The complete picture of the budget is a combination of the operational budget, the capital expenditure budget, and the policy document. And when I take all three together, I see a budget that, is it perfect? Of course not. Do I have some questions and have I had some questions? Sure. But to make it seem that, oh God, this budget is completely unrealistic, also maybe shows that there's also certain lack of understanding of what is actually being done. And I'll give one example. One of the things that has been questioned over and over is this situation of where the budget says we will be able to collect more tourism taxes or more taxes because of Airbnb. And then the question is asked, where is the law? How you could do that? And put something in the budget that there's no law. Mr. Chairman, I would like the minister to confirm what I would like to say. This would be the minister of Tiat and or minister of finance. But Airbnb properties as we know them, which are really technically called ODMs in Dutch, those type of properties, sharing economy units, fall under the existing Logier Gaste Belasting Lansford Ordning, the Hotel and Timeshare Tax Ordinance. Already. Let me explain why. When you read Article 1, and this is from the translated document, under the name guest, guest tax, so the hotel tax, which we call the Logier Gaste Belasting, it says, a direct tax is levied in terms of staying in hotels, comma, lodgings, guest houses, apartments, dwellings, or any other building suitable for accommodation in exchange for remuneration. It doesn't say only hotel properties. It doesn't say only someone that has a hotel license. It says anyone that stays in a unit temporarily in exchange for remuneration, you have to pay the 5%. So this is not a legal issue, what you're seeing in this budget. What you're seeing is a compliance effort. What do we mean by that? When you read the two lifting of the budget where the minister explains and where the CFT asks for an understanding on, well, how realistic is this? It gives various examples on how we will actually indeed be able to collect all of these fees. I have the Dutch version here, so I will paraphrase. But in essence, what they are saying is, we will actually now start to send letters to these units. We will now start to do educational and public relations program informing people, yes, we're happy, or this is how I would imagine it should be. We are happy that more local people are directly able to now get money from tourists. And we want to encourage and we want to blossom this industry. However, we just want to remind you that in accordance with Article 1, of the hotel ordinance, you are also subject to the 5% tax. Here's what you can do. Here's we attach a form where you can then go and fill it in and you can pay online or whatever, whatever, whatever. This is when it's due, it's due quarterly, et cetera, et cetera. Educate our people. Then inventorize it. And you know, in this digital age, that is actually the easy part. Because you know how you can know who is selling VRBO, Booking.com, or Airbnb properties? You go on the website. You can see the location, or you can have an idea of the location when you look at the picture. Because St. Martin is so small, oh yeah, that's somewhere up there, that's up by South Juar, or that's in Cole Bay, or that's in Simpson Bay. We can have that. Or on Airbnb, you can contact the person. Send a message. Hello, this is Mr. Bryson from the tax inspector. I just want to send you a reminder that we haven't received your tax forms, if you can please uh, send us your declaration for Airbnb. That's it. It's a compliance issue. As a matter of fact, I heard some of the members of parliament talk about the BOP summer program. And you know what might be a very interesting task for some of them to do? Because those kids, when it comes to doing things online and finding things, they'll do it faster than any one of us in here. They know the internet inside out. 
They know these Airbnbs and all these apps. Perhaps maybe they can even assist as part of the, of the BOP program, working with the Ministry of Tiat and the Tourist Bureau, and say, listen, you go out there and go find these places and send us the locations, make a list, make a nice Excel sheet, and let's get this inventorize them. That is something that is immediately executable, not something that it needs a law to go to the council of advice, et cetera. What I do know and do believe in the long term we should do, which would require a legislative amendment is one, we need to raise the hotel tax, because I'm, I'm gonna keep saying it, we have the lowest hotel tax in the entire Caribbean, 5%. Caribbean average is 12%. <laughs> and we also have to create a legal clause that allows us to write tax collection agreements for the hotel tax directly with these websites. So Expedia, um, um, uh, Travelocity, Booking.com, and also the ODM inventories like Airbnb and so on. Because that would indeed require some additional legislation to go into the tax collection agreement based on my research. But you don't need that in order to collect. It would just make it easier to collect. And a lot of um, comments I hear talk about, oh, is it realistic? How can we collect so much taxes from tourism? It's because I don't think we have a proper understanding, really, of what our economy is with tourism. And what I see in this budget is I see realistic, finally realistic projections on what we should be collecting from the 5% hotel tax and then the income tax that you should also be declaring from your income on these properties. And I want to give, show a few slides from the tourism exit survey. This was the... Last exit survey, I don't think it's that visible. I don't know if I could get a little zoom in there later. But this exit survey, it gives one of the most important sets of information to understand our industry, understand the number of people that are coming here, where are they coming from, how much are they spending. That's the data that can give you the projections to understand that it's absolutely not true that the incomes projected in this budget are not realistic, as long as we go and collect. As long as we start to focus maybe more on collecting from the tourism industry than only looking at the same local businesses over and over and say tax them, tax them, tax them, tax them. And when we can't tax them, let's tax them harder. And let's send them an Ann Manning and even if it ain't correct, let's hope they come back and pay something more still. But you have operators in the tourism industry that I will show you are not paying based on the mathematics what they should. Because if you look, for example, at what the average visitor stay is, according to the exit surveys, having a little bit of a hard time because they don't have page numbers, but I'll get to it. The average stay for tourists is 6.4, uh, let's call it 6.5 nights on average. Then if you take the average, and this is a very low projection, of just $104 per day in a hotel rate or an Airbnb rate, and if you do that times also, I think a relatively conservative figure of 400,000 uh, stayover tourists, you actually reach to $266 million in that industry. When you multiply that by just 5%, you are talking about 13 million, not guilders, dollars. So strictly speaking, if every single person, based on these statistics, actually pay what they're supposed to pay, we're not supposed to be collecting what the budget says, which is eight million. We're supposed to be collecting eight million guilders. We're actually supposed to be collecting 30 million dollars. And everybody keeps talking about how uncompliant the, the, the budget uh, uh, St. Martin is and, and our people. And, we, and I think as much as people can talk about the compliance of our business sector, I think it is grossly overstated. Because I think if you really, I have experienced it myself, where well, you get the Ann Manning for a company that was already closed. So if you go on paper based on companies, you might look at that and say many are not compliant. But real businesses operate in Samantin, what's the compliance there? It's probably, uh, it's probably impossible to know until, for example, the capital investment that the Minister of Finance is making in the tax department is put into place, and then we'll have a much better and revised tax system so that we can get a real figure but what I've just highlighted here is a compliance issue within the tourism sector. That literally money that comes out of the tourist pocket that should be coming to the government. 
That's where the effort should be. And that's where the effort I see in this budget. Very realistic, very doable, and the numbers are right here. Mr. Chairman, I would like to ask a question to, to all our ministers. Because it's a statement that this budget does not serve the interests of the people of St. Martin. That was, that was stated as well. You know, when you make a blanket statement like that, if you say, I don't believe that there are certain things in this budget that are not sufficiently helping the people of St. Martin, we can have a debate. But when you just unilaterally come here and say, this budget, this whole budget does not serve the interests of the people, that is just quite simply a lie. And I want to ask all our ministers, Minister of Finance, does the improvement to the financial management of the country elucidated and substantiated within this government serve the interests of the people of St. Martin? To the Minister of Tiat, do actions to invest in tourism, improvements to the business license process, and new income streams which were included on recommendation of the CFT that are budgeted, elucidated, and substantiated within this budget serve the interests of the people of St. Martin? To the Minister of Justice, do the funds budgeted for the retroactive payments as well as the policy actions and processes in place which are elucidated and substantiated within this budget serve the interests of the people of St. Martin? To the Minister of ECYS, do the investments in public schools and other items and sports budgeted and elucidated and substantiated within this budget serve the interests of the people of St. Martin? To the Minister of Rummy, does the improvements to the infrastructure, such as roads, sewage, that are, that are budgeted and elucidated and substantiated within this budget serve the interests of the people of St. Martin? The VSA, do the changes to the introduction of the social registry system, the big law, transitional culture program, CPI adjustments to the AOV pension, and the continued progress of the hospital that are budgeted, elucidated, and substantiated within this budget serve the people of St. Martin. And to the Prime Minister, did your success in getting co off the table, did your success in reversing the 12.5% cuts, did your success in representing us at a very high level within the kingdom, did your, all of the policy changes within this budget with regards to general affairs, do those serve the interests of the people of St. Martin? I believe the answer to these questions are yes. And I do not believe it is fair to say that this entire budget, that's what we said. They didn't say, no, there's certain parts of this budget that I don't understand. And again, I'm not here to tell opposition members that they can't be critical of the budget. And I've seen and I've heard some good criticism that I look forward to the answers to those questions. And maybe based on those questions, I might have further clarifications. That's why I don't need to repeat them because some of them were good. But what you had from some people here yesterday was just standing on a pulpit to find an excuse to vote no. What you also had is some interesting forms of deflection. Here you have, I mean, I, I looked to my right to my colleague, William Marlin, when I heard one of the first questions from the United Democrats, Minister of ECYS, what about the Monument Fund? I almost dropped down on my chair. I said, this, really? You want to ask about the Monument Fund? Mr. Chairman, I would like to ask the minister if he understands the motion that was passed to confirm that you understand that it's not for the Monument Fund to go and fix Diamond Estate. Huh? That's not what the motion said. The motion alludes to the ones ultimately responsible. Because if that's the angle she's trying to come with, like, maybe we could see if you get the monument fund in place, then, you know, and you won't have to pay that. Maybe somebody else could pay it instead. Then maybe that's what needs to happen. But not with the monument fund. I believe a monument fund needs to be established for the right purposes. To, per to make sure that our people can finally have the support to make our monuments the beauties that they can be like what we saw in Kiroso. 
But that stunt that he's trying to pull, no, sir. Mr. Chairman, let me move over to one question that I have to the Ministry of Justice. I, too, um, in my uh, brief visit to the Phillipsburg Police Station last Friday, there was one thing that I heard in the hallways that gave me a smile on my face. And that was the fact that throughout the hallways, this was, I think, the day after the police officers had received their letters in their positions. And police officer after police officer passing it to each other with smiles on their face, like, what? Boy, yeah, this is looking good, boy, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm hearing, at least at that moment, and with others that I've spoken to, a lot of positivity coming, at least out of that action thus far. So I'd like to ask the Minister of Justice, how is this process going? Is it indeed, um, have all the police officers received those letters as yet? What is the process for them to then reply to it, to confirm? Because some of them might say, yeah, but I'm going to write that email now. I'm taking this. So is it that they have to wait until they can accept it, or are some of them able to accept it, being that so many of them are happy with what they received in writing? And also, I just want to maybe ask the minister to clarify, because it appears that um, while some police officers or all police officers seem to have received something on the Herz von Bewaring end, I'm not sure if they have received it as yet. I don't know if it's going by department by department, but if the minister can maybe give us an update because that indeed though, if there's a lot of people within the police talking about, why oh, I got my letter, I'm happy, why well, this thing actually moving, why well, this government actually coming through for me. There's that positivity right now, but then we also want to make sure that other departments don't feel left out. So if the Minister of Justice can just confirm that aspect for me as well. To the Minister of Tiat, I would like to encourage the Minister of Tiat to continue to seek public-private partnerships. Um, when I was head of tourism, um, I had an experience with a public-private partnership that worked out very well. Because at the time, it was actually the first time I had a conversation with then Minister of Romy Emmanuel. And he had approached me with the tourist department because he had what I believe and still believe is a beautiful idea to put a flag representing St. Martin that you know, will, will give us a sense of pride, that can be a tourism attraction. But one of the things I pointed out to the MP at the time is that there's only so much we can do within our tourism budget, but Minister, is there any other way we can get some more additional help to do this? And you know what he suggested? Well, let's maybe do it as a public-private partnership. Let's see if we can get other companies involved. Let's see if we can get the cruise lines involved. Let's see if we can get the airport involved. So that was actually something that we worked on together. And at the time, we wrote the advice. And I would like to speak about that as well through you to the minister. Can Minister, can we follow up on that project from the tourism aspect? There is an advice there. Um, you know, at the time, uh, you know, we had the whole situation with the hurricane and so on. But I do believe it is a good tourism attraction. I'm not sure what is happening on Vromi's end in terms of the surroundings and so on. But what are our plans and visions throughout this year to finalize that project? Because, yes, not every plan that came from a previous government means that it can't continue, I think. That plan is something that I'm sure, in the same manner that you looked at the marketplace and you looked at the bus terminal, let's see if we can extend more private partner, private, uh, private public partnerships and that idea that you have at the marketplace to the flagpole. Um, to the Minister of Romy, very, very happy to hear about parking in Phillipsburg. I would like to come back again to the exit surveys of tourists. And just to explain again, exit surveys are conducted when the tourist is leaving the country. And the staff of the Statistics Department and Tourist Bureau, they actually go and they ask the people to fill in a certain questionnaire. Sometimes they can be incentivized to um, get a, a prize where they could return for a free hotel stay. And typically because they're waiting for their flight, you get, they, they, they sit down, they relax, they fill in the form, they reflect on what they like. And there's a slide here. Name one aspect you dislike about St. Martin. And do you know what the number one at the top 
is traffic and parking. Number one thing that they dislike. And they've grouped traffic and parking together because what we also noticed is that they are connected. Because one of the reasons I believe there was a transportation study and what it showed is that a part of the problem with Simpson Bay is the fact that people are stopping and lobbying and jockeying to try and find parking. So rather than having a central place to just go, turn in, Kim Sha, park there, and you have a multi-level parking lot, and then you can park, what is happening is people are like, oh, I'm trying to go to this restaurant. Oh, is that guy coming out? No, okay, let me keep going. They said, oh wait, this guy coming out, so now he's going to come out, and then you're going to wait until he reverses, and then you're going to come in. And when that happens for dozens of cars down the line, you have a block. Whereas if there was, for example, a central area, um, like there were plans at Kim Sha Beach, but also in Phillipsburg, where everybody knows, go there and park, there might be a roundabout so that the traffic flows, then you actually fix traffic and you fix parking. And although it's not specifically part of the exit surveys, I did do some myself as tourism director, and I like to ask further questions. And one of the things they said about parking in Phillipsburg is that it is not so much about the, the long walk or anything like that. It's really just that they need to have confidence that they come to Phillipsburg with their car and they don't have to know, okay, wonder if they have to go get parking and so on. Whereas instead of taking all that time driving around to try find parking, the tourists will say, you know what? Let me just go Orient Beach. Because Orient Beach, you never have a problem getting parking. Or well, let me go to Marigot, because Marigot, relatively, you have a much easier time finding parking. But Phillipsburg's biggest deterrent for tourist, tourists coming here, and locals also hate it, is parking. And I believe it is time, and I want to hear from the Minister of Romy that a sincere effort is being made to ensure that without obstructing the plans of the Parliament building, because the Parliament building will also need a multi-level parking lot, but there needs to be a multi-level parking lot coming to the center of Phillipsburg. So I would like to hear more from the minister of that. And also, where are we with regards to the new parliament building? I know that part of that is a question, let's say, to our own committee, yourself, and, um, yourself as vice chair and MP Marlin as chair. But I do know that a lot of work has been put in to actually getting that ball rolling. The secretariat has put something together. Uh, all of the specifications, but where is it now on the government's end? I would like an update on that because Parliament cannot do it on our own. We can't, we're not an envy that can go and take loans or, or do this or do that. We require the government support. There's a motion in that regard, and I would like an update from the relevant ministers, be it Romy, Finance, or Prime Minister, whoever, regarding the Parliament building. To the Minister of uh, ECYS, you know, Minister, I'm not going to ask you any, um, any questions because I think there were quite a lot of good questions posed in your direction. I think I would want to more make a statement, Minister. I would like the Minister to be encouraged, but also very, I don't know if cautious is the word. What I mean by that is the Minister, actually no, caution is not the word, very detailed and careful with all the happenings within your ministry and the details of what's going on and documents and whether the parliament gets answers to letters or attending meetings and so on. Because I don't want the minister to be in a situation like what we had with the courthouse where well, the courthouse ain't got no permit, me even know. Is there a way the minister can somehow get weekly briefings, just a, a nice one page, let's say from the Monument Council, from this department, this department, and read and understand what's going on, and go down to these departments and speak to them and hear from them. Give them your ear. Whatever has gone on, sit one on one and say, look, we all here for the same thing, for St. Martin. We're here for the country. And whatever differences or whatever... Um, uh, if there's anything I need to know, please feel the free to tell me. And minister, listen. Listen honestly. And see if there's anything that you're really missing from that department. I think that's where MP Duncan was going. Is, that, is there something brewing in your department that, that they want to get off their chest and they don't feel that 
I could, I could talk to my minister. Maybe it's not your fault through you, Mr. Chairman. Maybe it's not the minister's fault. But maybe there needs to be that forum opening up. I don't know. I, I, I'm just throwing something out there. Because I always say, I mean, I try my best to learn and understand the ministry of ECYS. But education is such a complex topic. And that's why I'm so happy that we have some people within parliament that get the ins and outs of this, much like I might about tourism, but they know this thing from the back of their hand. But when you hear those same individuals pointing out this, I, I can't believe that it's just political. There must be something that you got to find out and get to the bottom of. And then what is political, you deal with it the expert way that he can. Because when it comes to politics, ain't nobody know more than Samuel. Well, let me not say that. William sitting next to me. But he knows a lot. Finally, I would like to go over a proposal and an, uh, two amendments that I would like to be presenting. And I will actually go into more details with them in the second round. But at this part of the round, there are two things that I found within the budget that I think need some urgent attention. I've asked the Minister of Finance and actually all ministers to look within the leisure for ordinance where you have many fees in there that are very outdated. Look at what we're doing with the cinema ordinance, for example, where we're adjusting that to find all these little aspects where you have things that have stayed stagnant for, I believe the cinema ordinance is back to 1968 or something like that. What was two guilders in 1968 is not two guilders today. So I would like to get an analysis, and, and maybe, you know what, not for this budget, but I will be asking, I will say it like this, I will be asking, perhaps in writing, to all ministers to take a month or two and do a review of all those fees and send it back as a response to me in writing. That will come in writing, so there's no need for the civil service to take note of that. I'm just mentioning it here um, because those letters will be forthcoming after the budget debate to each minister because it's time that we do an analysis of that. You see, we keep talking about tax reform, but... Taxes are indeed a big part of our income and will probably always be the largest part of our income. But when you look at the budget, you also notice the many fees. You know, you have your building permit fees, you have your inspection fee, you have your this fee, you have that fee. And those fees have remained stagnant for decades. So it's time for an update. But one of them that I think we can address immediately are those within the Ministry of TIAT. Uh, related to inspection, especially since I believe in the policy document, you already see that there are efforts being made to adjust the inspection prices. So one of the amendments I would want to bring that could bring some additional funds to the ministry um, would be related to that. And I would just like maybe from a technical perspective, the Minister of Finance can give his view on such an amendment uh, to adjust that part of the leisures to make sure that it matches our inspection fees correctly uh, and our budget. And the other uh, amendment that I will be presenting is related to tourism investment. And I use the term very in, uh, investment very particularly. Um, Mr. Chairman, I started earlier by saying one of the things that I enjoy the most about this budget is that while being able to bring the budget back to realistic numbers and actuals, what you also see on the other side of the budget, in the capital side, is you see well-formulated, well-planned and thought out capital investments. Um, what I did not see within the capital, like in, invest, uh, the capital budget, however, is perhaps more investment within the Ministry of TIAT, but actually specifically tourism. And of course, with capital expenditures, as a member of parliament, one has to be very careful about that. Because it's not a matter of just bringing an amendment and saying, okay, look, put nine million guilders there and invest it in tourism. Because that's an absolute waste. Because what will happen is the amendment will pass, the budget will pass, and when it's time for the minister to then go and actually get the funding, what you have is, well, you have not presented a plan. So I was very cognizant of that. So for that reason, I researched and asked in the Central Committee regarding, oh, let me pull up this document. 
Yes. Regarding a World Bank NRPB project called St. Martin Tourism Recovery Priority Action Plan. This was done in February of 2020. And this plan is a very extensive 40-page document that did an analysis of the tourism industry and really look at where the key areas are where we have to bring investments. And while some of the aspects of this report deal with operational items, so that is stuff that you would want to handle within your operational budget, there are various items that actually point to capital investments, investing in your asset. So for example, one of the things it speaks of is something that I used as sort of the Bible of tourism, which was the tourism master plan. A lot of people have heard of this tourism master plan, I believe it was created in 2005. And to this day, I bet you the minister will notice some advices that will come to him as a minister of TIAT related to tourism, still quote the tourism master plan of 2005 because that's how good a document it was as a guideline to what we should be doing with tourism. But we don't have a current tourism master plan. And one of the things that this project, this World Bank document highlighted is the need for investing and creating a tourism master plan. And that is, if there's anything is an asset for TIAT, that's an asset. Because that's something that you can keep that's something that can be used by the operational side as a guideline to actually maximize what you spend. Then you have to look at what they talk about in terms of our intellectual property. You see, in the operational budget, what we do is we communicate or try to sell to tourists. Now, you would say, strictly speaking, what we sell is the island. Or let's say, colloquially speaking, you would say, what you're selling is the island. But from a marketing perspective, what you're actually selling is the intellectual property of the country. What does that mean? You have the logo, you have the images, you have the videos, you have all of this. But St. Martin, one of the things that was inventorized by the World Bank document is that St. Martin actually does not have, other than its vacation St. Martin thing, which is, I think, very outdated and deserves a new, fresh look we have not invested in creating new intellectual property in the forms of not just the branding, but also a media package archive, which for example, if you go to the Aruba Tourism website and you sign yourself up as either a media personnel or as an ODM, as a, as a, a tour operator, you get access to a, 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 a file or a website with gigabytes and gigabytes of every possible video to every possible detail that you want. If you want to advertise for this, or you want to put something of a, of a couple sitting on Mullet Bay having wine in that media archive, you would find it. So you, all of the people that are doing the marketing for you, they will already be able to search within that archive and say, um, because I'm going to sell Carnival, let me find an image of Carnival while going through Front Street. You have to build that archive. You have to invest in it. And you have to pay for people to be able to create that and upload it to the internet and have access to it. That's one of the things that is in that proposal as well. It also talks about product improvement, which are more traditional capital investments. So for example, tour bus pullover areas. In the exit surveys on the cruise side, they note that the average tour, only 3% of people stop in Phillipsburg, 3%. That is astronomically low. And what is one of the main reasons why? They don't have a place to pull over. This is not a little taxi or a bus. They need specific areas where they can safely, because that's why these tour buses, no matter how much the stores will ask them or the government will ask them say, if I pull over on the side of the road and one of my clients get knocked down, are you going to pay for it? No, sir. And if you do, which the minister is proposing, and have one pullover area, the other problem you might create is that you might centralize your tours too much, rather than having multiple locations where there's a central bus terminal where tour buses can pull over, but there should also be one up the road, there should be one further down, there should be at least four within Phillipsburg. I would even say there should be also another area in Cole Bay 
find somewhere around that strip where you have all these different food vendors and so on. Right down there. Have an area in Simpson Bay where they can pull over. We need to identify tour bus pullover areas within the, the budget, and that is one of the plans within this NRPB report. Also, the creation of public bathrooms and beaches, uh, furnishings in popular tourism areas, including garbage bins, benches, and this is something that the report also really was very critical of St. Martin, is the lack of accessibility-friendly um, um, furnishings and access. That one of the complaints we get is that we're not sufficiently access accessible. And then also, um, investment into the creating of the St. Martin Tourism Authority. This has been on the capital expenditure budget before, um, but was ne never, I don't, I don't believe, I mean, we don't have an STA, so I don't think it was actually materialized. And then the other thing is uh, root development investment, which would be in owning our own proprietary computer systems under the Roots 360 Sabre operating systems that actually help us to get more routes traveling to St. Martin. It's one of the things that Aruba is way ahead of us. They use technology to get access to the reservation systems of the airlines. And when you have that information and you create your own GDS system and you access that information, you already know 12 months in advance why American Airlines looking to add more flights to St. Kitts. So I need to make sure strategically that I am able to compete with that. I need to go talk to American Airlines now. But you need to invest in the operating system and the computer system, et cetera. So those are one of the things I have to do. So I will be presenting in the second round. I'm currently, however, um, making a few adjustments because I want to make sure that it's not an amendment that now puts the, the, the Ministry of Finance, especially in a position where they cannot continue with the um, with the, the this part of the capital expenditure because it's not sufficiently motivated. However, uh, the attached documents that will include the plan from the World Bank, the concept paper, which was uh, an additional document to stakeholders that was also added, as well as the breakdown of the finances are also something that will be included in that amendment. But in order to continue with that, I do have one question to uh, the Minister of Tiat. If the Minister of Tiat can please, uh, in anticipation of what I just described, can the Minister please get in contact or together with the Prime Minister, with the NRPB, uh, in terms of a statement of the viability of this, that they can also confirm that they would be able to be, let's say, the executing agency, that, if the, that they can put all of the necessary information that CFT may need. Um, they have a lot of that experience, but I would like to hear it for the record if the Minister can get that from the director of the NRPB to see if they are able and equipped to do this because that will be very important for this amendment to be able to go forward because we, we, we need a good executing agency. And if you look at the national ordinance, a lot of people actually look, let's say, at the NRPB as just a trust fund entity. However, strictly speaking, the... Um, I had the article here from the NRPB law. Anyway, within the law from the NRPB, it describes that it also, uh, fun projects not funded by the trust fund can also, they can also basically support that. So I would like to ask the minister of TIAT as well as slash the prime minister who is responsible for NRPB to give their comments on that. Um, in closing, I want to leave with some information that I've uncovered and I've, you know, constantly trying to understand the political atmosphere of St. Martin or the political motivations of some. As much as we say St. Martin is very unique, perhaps there are on the level of a political science level, some very scholarly explanations for what the UP party has faced, for what this coalition has faced, for what this country is facing. And indeed, there is a very interesting dissertation from, or paper, from Mr. Kevin Arsenault. He's, a, he's the head of the Department of Political Science in Temple University, Philadelphia. And he wrote a fascinating paper that I've read three times because I can find myself so much in it. I can find myself seeing the type of people that this describes. And I will read a part of the abstract for you, Mr. Chairman. 
people from political attitudes, sorry, people form political attitudes to serve their own psychological needs. Re recent research shows that some individuals have a strong desire to incite chaos when they perceive themselves to be marginalized by others. These individuals tend to see chaos as a way to invert the power structure and gain their own social status and positions. Analyzing data from large-scale representative surveys conducted in Australia, Canada, the United Kingdom, and the United States, we identify the prevalence of, quote, the need for chaos across Anglo-Saxon political societies. Using latent profile analysis, we explore whether different subtypes underlie the unidimensional construct and find evidence that some people are indeed motivated to seek out chaos because they want to rebuild the political society while others enjoy destruction simply for their own sake. We demonstrate that chaos seekers are not a unified political group but a divergent set of malcontents. Multiple pathways can lead individuals to, quote, want to watch the world burn. Mr. Chairman, there are some that just want to see things burn. There are some that generally really are not happy maybe with the direction they're going, and you can see the difference in the discourse. But Mr. Chairman, it reminds me of one of my favorite parables in the Bible, 1 Kings 3.16, where Solomon was faced with two mothers that claim to have the same child, that they claim it was their own. And they went to King Solomon, and they both said that this is their child, this is mine. It's me who bring this to the world, it's I who build this. And Solomon said, you know what? Fetch me my sword. And he said, the only solution I have to this is I'm going to take this sword and I'm going to cut the baby in half and each of you can have half. Let's just destroy it and done. And one of them, she said, yes. Because if he can't have it, I mean, if she can't have it, I can't, nobody can't have it. That's what she said. And do you know what the other one said? It's okay. No. I love what this creation is. I love what this can stand for. I love the potential of this child to grow. And what did Solomon decide? That was the one that he decided should have the child. And the mother left, upset. But that other mother stayed with the child. So Mr. Chairman, I encourage all of us to stay strong especially this year, it is only going to get worse. I know that I am prepared on behalf of the UP party to take whatever I can to stand up for what we believe in. But I do believe that it will only get worse because when you start as a member of parliament to go after things like Mullet Bay and call them out when they destroy monuments, and call them out and bring motions and tell them, go pay. No, you won't get an offer shipyard. It's the same group of people always. You don't notice that, Mr. Chairman? But I will not stop because I know what I signed up for. And I know that the prayers of the people and the love that I receive, they see what I do. And they know that myself, my party, and our coalition are doing our best to work in the best interest of St. Martin. Just like this budget is a reflection of the best effort we could have possibly put together, all things considered, to serve the people of St. Martin. So I will be supporting this budget. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, MP Bryson. Some members have requested for a, a short break, but Looking at the time, it's kind of lunchtime, so we will adjourn for lunch and we'll return 2.15. Meeting adjourned till 2.15.